King 5 News. A Washington law is supposed to protect domestic violence victims from abusers armed with guns. The law says people served with protection orders must surrender their guns to police. But a King 5 investigation has revealed hundreds of abusers who never surrender and just ignore that law. Tonight, Chris Ingalls shows you a new program that should keep domestic abuse victims safer. And every single time, it's, it starts out the same. They're sweet, they're loving. A string of bad relationships came to an end when Michael Thomas, a minister and ex-police officer, entered the picture. Or at least that's what Crystal Velasco thought. When they're sorry, they'll come back. They'll be sweet, they're nice, tell you they love you, bring you flowers, tell you they're sorry. And you believe it. Things changed a few months into the relationship, according to this protection order filed in King County Court. Crystal said Thomas punched me in the head, pulled my hair, and suffocated me in a chokehold in beatings that started when she became pregnant with Thomas's child. Things are starting to get more violent, more violent, because now you have a child, now they think they own you. I was scared the whole time filling out that restraining order. I was worried that when he finds out, what is he going to do? Even more scary, the ex-cop and avid hunter had a closet full of guns. I don't know what he's capable of. He's, he's made severe threats. People served with protection orders are barred by law from owning or possessing guns. But the King 5 investigators found enforcement of that law is rare. All rise. In King County Court, accused abusers are ordered to appear either with a receipt showing they've surrendered their firearms to police or this signed document swearing they don't have any guns. On this day, only three of 34 people summoned show up to face the judge. We reviewed King County Court data showing abusers in 47% of cases, nearly half, simply don't respond to the weapon surrender order. It's appalling to attorneys who represent abuse victims in court, like William Braun. I see today's situation as playing Russian roulette with the lives of victims of domestic violence. On the March day that Michael Thomas appeared for his firearms hearing, he told the judge he had no guns, a conversation recorded by the court. There was an allegation that you had a handgun or shotgun. We had a handgun years ago, and nobody, she never seen any handguns on me. Thomas signed this form swearing, I do not have any firearms. But the one day that Michael Thomas appeared in court was unlike any other at the King County Courthouse. That's because Chris Anderson, head of the Domestic Violence Unit of the Seattle City Attorney's Office, was sitting in the courtroom. We walked out of the courtroom, called the victim. She said, he has firearms. And I said, well, how do you know that? She says, well, they're right here. I have them in my house. Anderson's call to Crystal would never have happened on a routine day. But in March, Anderson was part of an experiment by the criminal justice system to see how many abusers flaunt the law prohibiting gun possession. It showed me the, how blatant people can be when they don't believe that anyone's following up on this, and that was the case for many, many years. Crystal supplied photos of Thomas's guns, and authorities obtained his hunting license, enough evidence to get a search warrant to enter Thomas's Maple Valley home. We found a Glock 40 that was in a, a safe. We found two shotguns and th uh, two hunting rifles and a hunting bow, all of which the court, all of which he stood in front of the court and said, I don't have any guns and none of them belong to me. Getting those guns is key because statistics show more than half of domestic violence homicides are committed by people prohibited from owning firearms. 42% of domestic violence murder victims are children and more than half of all mass shootings are related to domestic violence. These are the cases that are keeping us up at night. It wasn't just Michael Thomas. Of the handful of others that actually showed up to court on that March day, two other men are also accused of lying to the judge about their guns. How many guns did you identify just in that one day that did not go reported? Eleven. Eleven guns. Right. All guns that are now in the hands of police, with Thomas and the others charged with perjury and unlawful possession of firearms, charges to which Thomas has pleaded not guilty. What did you think when they told you they'd taken all those guns out of his house? <sighs> I felt so relieved that at least I have that not to worry about. Now I have to, I have to stop. I have to make sure it doesn't keep going on. And I have to keep moving forward because my kids need me. 
Seattle police, the city attorney, and King County judges plan to keep more victims uh, like Crystal safer, hopefully. Uh, Seattle City Council has just approved funding to hire two more people to monitor those court hearings and to follow up on suspicions that abusers are lying about their guns. And they will coordinate investigations that will help prosecutors and judges make the decisions on evidence, not just based on somebody's word in court. Now, Chris, we all know that guns are dangerous, so why is it that the courts did not take this issue seriously until now? Yeah, I have to tell you, there's been some finger pointing going on here with parts of the criminal justice system saying that it's somebody else's responsibility to do that. But a task force has been studying this, and with a commitment from the uh, Seattle City Council, there's now money in place to pay for these investigations. So it's not happening yet, but going forward, hopefully there'll be more of these investigations and they'll uncover more liars in court. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, you bet.